We know that after the Babylonian, or prior to the Babylonian uh, captivity, the Israelites in the southern kingdom had many problems. Their worst king was Manasseh, but the second worst king was Ahaz. He ruled about 30 years earlier, and he was a very close second to uh, what we have with uh, Manasseh. You may remember from our study of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 that even though Ahaz was evil, God told him to ask for a sign, and he would give it to him, a sign that would demonstrate that Israel and Syria would not come up against Judah and take it captive. However, Ahaz was so wicked, he refused to ask for a sign, even though God told him to give one. So, God gave him one, which involved the birth, uh, virgin birth of Jesus. And uh, as God promised, those foreign powers were not around within just five years of that time period. But neither King Ahaz nor the people of the nation of Judah improved any. Therefore, Isaiah was sent to them with another message. God knew how they would react to it. God knows his people. He knows all things. And uh, so he was prepared for their reaction. Isaiah was sent to them with a message. And uh, God knew that they would basically reject that message. Now, outwardly, they were worshipers of Jehovah God. If you would ask them, that's what they would say. Outwardly, they went through some of the forms and so forth. But inwardly, they didn't have any confidence in God. And uh, they were going to say to Isaiah, Seek those who are mediums and wizards who chirp and mutter, according to the American Standard Version. They were, uh, perhaps some of the uh, mediums, were those who, who chirped and peeped like birds. And uh, some of the wizards were among those who would moan and mutter various things. But as we look at this verse, what, what are they asking for? They want someone to be contacted like the woman at Endor, remember, that Saul uh, sought because she had a familiar spirit? Because uh, they would find maybe someone who could inquire of the dead concerning the future? In other words, they wanted to consult uh, ghosts and uh, shades and uh, people that did not, were not living and could not possess real answers. Like birds, these familiar spirits chirped and peeped, or they moaned and muttered. But of course, this was all for effect on the part of the medium, that is, the one with the familiar spirit. The medium or the wizard would make these various sounds and then be able to translate them for those who sought their advice. And that message would be claimed to have come from those who were dead. The inhabitants of Judah would actually approach Isaiah and ask him to con uh, consult these individuals about the future. Imagine asking a prophet of God to go to such sources. Of course, he would refuse to do that. But God, knowing what they would demand, already had an answer prepared for Isaiah to give them. 
And that answer comes in the form of a question. Should not a people seek their God? If they overtly worship Jehovah, shouldn't they seek Jehovah for an answer? You would think. That seems like an obvious question, doesn't it? Who are we? We're Israelites. From whom are we descended? From Abraham. In whom did he trust? Jehovah. How much did he trust Jehovah? To the point of being willing to sacrifice his only begotten son. Now there is a man with faith. Did they have faith? Then why don't they consult their own God? But they would choose somebody who was dead to give them a word over the true and living God. And by the way, that same God brought Israel up out of the land of Egypt and they didn't have to fight a single battle for their independence. God arranged them for, to leave the country. And then when they did go in and did have to fight battles and conquer the land, they were uh, successful because Jehovah fought their battles for them. So why are they now willing to consult mediums and wizards instead of trusting in God in this situation? A similar situation occurred in Israel in the days of Elijah. You may remember from 2 Kings chapter 1, what happened. Now there's a lot more than we're going to take time to look at that happens after uh, what we're going to take a look at these three verses, but 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 2. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice of the upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Jehovah? No. Go inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. Now, isn't that about as silly as what's being asked now? And here's the response in verses 3 and 4. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise and go to the messengers of the king of Samaria and say this to them, Is it because there's no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, You shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Why did he seek the advice of a pagan deity? Why would anybody do that? Now, this is not a, a dead person, but it is a false god. And, uh, of course, Elijah's answer was, because you have chosen error instead of truth, because you have chosen a false god instead of the true and living god, you're not going to recover from uh, your injury. Why is it that people go sometimes to the heavens for an answer? They'll consult the stars, the constellations. Uh, what's uh, Orion got to say about this? Really, I don't think much, but people go there, don't they? They get the horoscope out and they read this and they read that and, and some people take it seriously. And then they go to those that are not gods, gods of this earth like Ekron or some other deity constructed and invented by man. Or they go to the realm of the dead and hope they can get some kind of an answer there. 
It's so bizarre, they go to all of these places anywhere but to the God who created the heavens and the earth. Why do they reject him and not go to him? Perhaps the chirps and peeps and mutters and moans are more ambiguous and comforting and friendly than thus says the Lord. They do not seem to like that answer. It's as though people are willing to search for answers anywhere but where the truth is located. Now there's a second question that Isaiah is told to ask. And that is, should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? What makes you think that the dead have some kind of special knowledge? Is it that they are spirits without a physical body now? Does that give them a measure of freedom? Are they allowed to wander into the realm of the future? Why would God allow them to do that, if it were even possible? What are the mechanics of how this thing is supposed to work? It seems like it goes like this. And we'll just use King Saul as an example. God won't talk to me. What shall I do? Well, if all else fails, contact a dead person. Oh, yeah, that'll probably work. Why? Why would anybody think that that would work? Consider what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 9.5. For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything. Hmm. The dead do not know the future. Those who are living know one fact about the future, that they're going to die. But the dead don't even know that. They don't have any knowledge of the future, and yet they are consulted as though they might be experts on the subject. So what is God's answer to these two questions, these two very pertinent, uh, very important questions? And the answer is, to the law. Well, what law? What law is he talking about? Undoubtedly, the law of Moses. That's the covenant that they lived under. We wouldn't tell people to go to the law of Moses, but since they were living under that covenant, God told them to go to the law of Moses. And uh, there's another part to this. To the testimony. What testimony? Well, it could refer, and probably did refer, to the Ten Commandments originally, which God spoke and then wrote with his own finger. Or, as time went on, it probably came to encompass and become synonymous with the law altogether. So originally, maybe a narrow sense of the Ten Commandments, a testimony that God gave personally to Israel, but then a larger, broader ex uh, definition came later on. The word in the singular, testimony, occurs in Psalm 119, verse 88. The plural use, testimonies, occurs 36 times in the Old Testament, none in the New, and of those 36 times, 22 are in Psalm 119. 61% of the time the word testimonies appear, it's in Psalm 119, which glorifies what? The Word of God. If you want to read something that extols the Word of God and tells us how great that it is, and all that it can accomplish, and uh, how that it ought to be glorified, read Psalm 119. The whole psalm is dedicated to showing us the value of the Word of God. Certainly, those in Isaiah's day needed 
to know the value of the Word of God. Just a further note on that, law and testimonies in Psalm 119 are also used interchangeably with the way, uh, His ways, precepts, God's Word, statutes, judgments, and commandments. All of these are used interchangeably. So instead of seeking the heavens, earthly gods, or those who have died, go to the law. Go to the Word of God. This is where you find answers. Now, if they fail to speak according to God's Word, it is because they have no light in them. Verse 20. Now, light is an all right translation, but it's actually a little more pinpointed than that. It usually refers to early light, morning light, in fact, dawn. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn in them, not even a small amount of light. Uh, amount of light. They just don't have it. It's not in them. They are in darkness and they will probably remain in darkness by their own choice. Now, we might be tempted to say, well, it certainly is good that we don't have that problem in our society today. Uh, do we not have that problem? About one in four people believe in reincarnation, despite Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. It is appointed unto men to die once, and after this, the judgment. People don't keep dying and dying and living and being born and dying and coming back hundreds of times. The Bible doesn't teach that. People did not get that idea from the scriptures. It's not there. And how many do you suppose consult an astrologer, a tarot cards, a palm reader, a trance channeler? Many people in society are willing to try any or all of those things, but not the word of God. They're willing to go to astrology above God's on the earth, the dead under the earth. They're willing to do all of that. But then do not take the time to read and comprehend the word of God. So, the same question could be asked, couldn't it? Why are you consulting the dead on behalf of the living? And the answer is the same. The same question uh, and the same answer is valid today just as it was in Isaiah's time. The answer is to the law and to the testimony. Of course, when we say that, we're referring not to the law of Moses, but to the perfect law of liberty as mentioned by James chapter 1 verse 25, that is the New covenant of Jesus Christ. But this is where answers are to that law, to that testimony. And it is still the case that if somebody does not go there, it is because there is no dawn in them. There's not even the beginning of light. There's not even a flicker of light. Many are without that light. But... The fact is that the light is available. It's not that you can't see it, no pun intended, but people don't want that light. It's there. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The gospel is called light. Christians are called light. We shine in a world of darkness. There is plenty of light around, but many simply do not want to seek it. They don't want to receive it. 
They don't want to live by it. The Bible is not complicated. Are there some complicated sections? Yes. But overall, it's not complicated. There are many things that are said that, that you just have to try hard to misunderstand. For example, Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. I don't know how much uh, clearer that could be. Do you believe? Oh, yeah. Are you willing to be baptized? Well, I don't know about that. Well, why not? Both are required. Both are necessary. Both precede salvation. He who, A, believes, and B, is baptized, shall be saved. But he that believes not shall be condemned. Now, I don't believe you have to have a degree in physics to understand that. You don't even have to have a degree in literature to understand that. If you can understand plain, clear language, you can understand that. And if you read the book of Acts and you look at all of the people who were converted and those conversions being described, you will understand that. The only thing you need to worry is that someone will get up and say, Oh, uh, well, um, that's not really necessary. What do you mean it's not necessary? And who gave you the authority to say that? Who gave you the authority to contradict Jesus with what he said? Who gave you the authority to contradict Peter when he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Who gave you the authority to say, oh, um, yeah, go ahead and repent, but you don't need this baptism part. Who gave you that authority? Do you have any light in you? Is there any dawn in you? Why would people want to reject something so clearly stated? And yet, many people do. So our answer to those in the world who are seeking signs in the heavens above or on the earth beneath or under the earth, our message is to the law and to the testimony. That's where truth lies. And uh, for those who are looking for religious answers, they're here. You just have to read them and uh, notice what it is they're saying and that people contradict those things. But don't let them contradict the Word of God. If the Word of God says it, it's right. You can believe it. You can trust in it. But then there are also those in the church who are trying to take people away from what the New Testament teaches trying to take them away from it on uh, salvation. People like Max Licato who, who say, no, no, uh, you believe first and then you can and be saved and then you can be baptized. Is that what Jesus said? He who believes is saved and should be baptized? No, he says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. We notice that inversion of the word order Maybe nobody thought we would, but we did. It doesn't match the scriptures. And then there are those who are trying to get us away from correct worship and following the New Testament pattern for worship and for doctrine and for teaching. But we say the same thing to the law and to the testimony. Some just have no light in them. And they have moved away from truths that they once knew and understood, but are now going in a different direction. If you are thinking about obeying the gospel, think about what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16. Think about what uh, Peter said 
in Acts verse 2 and verse 38. And we can throw in another dozen if you want. Think about what Saul of Tarsus was told. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. He still had sins. They didn't disappear on the road to Damascus. Three days later, he still had them. He needed to arise, be baptized, and then his sins would be washed away. And we could go on with several other passages, but all you have to do is read them fairly and honestly. If we can help you make that decision about being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, let us know. If we need uh, and you would wish to study, let us know. If you're already a child of God, do not listen to those who would take you away from the truths that you were taught and that you knew and were assured of. Back to the law, the perfect law of liberty. Back to the testimony that God has revealed. If we can help you in either one of these cases, let us know while we stand and while we sing.